Welcome to Food for Thought. I'm Colleen Patrick Goudreau from Compassionate Cooks, which I founded to empower people to make informed food choices and to debunk myths about vegetarianism and animal rights. You can learn more about who we are and what we do by visiting CompassionateCooks.com. Because I teach cooking classes and workshops and am a visible and vocal advocate for animals, I'm asked every question under the sun about vegetarianism, about cooking, nutrition, animal rights, animal welfare. And most of the time, the person asking the question really is interested in the answer. And engaging in this discussion, engaging in this dialogue that's virtually absent from public discourse is one of my favorite things to do. And I have immense respect for people who really do want to become informed about this topic, this topic being vegetarianism and animal rights. There are occasions, however, when I've heard people throw out really tenuous arguments for eating anim animals, for eating, for eating animals. And the difference is that these people tend not to be interested in a response or engaging in any kind of intelligent discussion or really any kind of dialogue at all. Their arguments are usually in the form of a defiant statement rather than a critical question and are usually said in passing or in such a way that reveals their defensiveness rather than their openness. Nonetheless, I think it's important to speak to these arguments as tenuous as they are in my mind because as long as they go unchallenged people will continue to think they hold weight and keep agreeing that they're somehow valid that's what i find oftentimes when people make these statements nobody argues with them nobody challenges them people just sit around agreeing and it's because of most most of the time people are saying these things to people who do agree with them so Let's let's examine one of the most common arguments people use to justify animals. It goes something like this. Humans were meant to eat meat. Just take a look at our teeth. Look at these incisors in my mouth. Clearly, we're meant to, to eat animals. Then they usually stop there, or they leave the room, or they change the subject, never really giving the opportunity uh, to the recipient to, to respond. And in a separate podcast, which will essentially be part two, we'll look at the physiological differences between herbivores and carnivores. But first, I wanted to take some time to preface that response. And that's what we'll do here, because there are some important things to address before we draw those comparisons. Whenever people say such things as my incisors prove humans were meant to eat meat or humans have been eating meat for thousands of years so it's clear it's natural for us, if they stuck around long enough to hear the response, I would want to say this to them. I would say, yes, humans are capable of processing meat. Clearly, they are. I would never state definitively that humans in the thousands of years of our development ate only plant foods and never ate animals. What I will say is this, before the development of an agricultural society, which was only 10,000 years ago that this started, the earliest humans ate mostly plant-based foods and they relied on them, not animals, for their sustenance and nutrition. That's a fact. Any meat they ate was supplementary and not the foundation of their diet, so much so that many anthropologists agree that gatherer-hunter is a more accurate description than hunter-gatherer, right? You see, because it's gathering or foraging for the food that was the primary method by which our early ancestors attained their food. Jim Mason, by the way, refers to early humans as foragers in his book, and I highly recommend this book. I can't recommend it highly enough. It's called An Unnatural Order. It's by Jim Mason, M-A-S-O-N. It's called An Unnatural Order, and the full title is An Unnatural Order, The Roots of Our Destruction of Nature. I highly recommend it. In it, Mason comprehensively examines from an anthropological, socio-cultural, and a holistic perspective how and why we have cut ourselves off from other animals and the natural world and the toll this has taken on us and the world around this. It's written for lay people, not academics, so please pick it up. It's a fascinating and insightful read. In relation to this, whenever people point to our ancestors eating animals, 
I, I find this very fascinating, by the way, because it may be one of the few times modern humans who so pride themselves, so pride themselves on how sophisticated we are today and how much more civilized we are than our early ancestors. It may be one of the few times that we actually align ourselves with cavemen and cave women to justify something we're doing in the 21st century. I find that rather ironic and somewhat amusing, I suppose, if it weren't so sad. Anyway, um, whenever people point to, the, to our ancestors, our human ancestors eating animals, they're neither accurately representing their diet, the ancestors, nor are they accurately representing the diet of modern humans. As I just said, early humans ate very little meat, nothing close to the amount that people are eating today, nothing close to the amount that, that people are eating today of meat or, or dairy or other animal products. So the argument is virtually irrelevant to how we live our lives today. I'm not sure what the point is. The most important thing I want to emphasize is also, even though we're capable of doing something, that doesn't mean we should do it, right? I mean, just because our bodies have the physical ability to process meat and other animal products, it doesn't mean it's the best choice. I mean, take a look at how we're doing on this on this animal-based diet, on this meat, dairy, and egg-based diet. The Western countries whose diets are primarily animal-based have ridiculous rates of diseases related to meat, dairy, and eggs. They've been indisputably related to meat, dairy, and eggs, heart disease, stroke, some cancers, kidney disease, so many diseases that are linked with these with these products. And compare that to our non-Western counterparts whose diets consist solely of plant foods or primarily of plant foods, and you'll see just the opposite. They don't have these preventable, largely preventable diseases that we're inflicted with or really inflicting upon ourselves in many ways. Um, so though they're technically capable of it, our bodies really aren't doing very well dealing with the amount of animal foods we put in them. We're killing animals by the billions and killing ourselves in the process, literally. And I don't say that lightly. I teach cancer prevention and cancer survival classes as well. And that's not to say that I, we should blame ourselves for the diseases that we are, um, we're getting, but it does say that there are things that we should be aware of that if we can do everything in our power to prevent certain diseases like, like heart disease specifically and stroke, then we should. And it has been shown, the work of Dean Ornis has shown that heart disease is not only preventable, it's reversible when we change our diets and get the animal products out of our diets. So I don't say that very lightly. I say that very seriously, that we have the power to change our, our health and improve it. The other thing I want to say is being capable of doing something doesn't mean it's our right to do it, especially when another individual may suffer consequences. We're capable of doing a lot of things as individuals and as a society, but we keep ourselves in check because some things are just inappropriate or unethical. I mean, we're all capable of killing each other. I mean, we're all capable of killing someone else. We all have that ability and sometimes we have the desire, but that doesn't mean we actually do it or that it's right to do it. Most of us agree that it's not our right to take the life of someone else, that someone's right to live takes precedence over our right for whatever we think we have a right for, revenge or pleasure, satisfaction, whatever it is, we have all agreed that it's not the right thing to do. So just because we can doesn't mean we should. So even if I weren't able to illustrate that our physiology resembles herbivores substantially more than it resembles carnivorous animals, simply by virtue of the fact that we can survive and actually thrive on a plant-based diet and have no nutritional requirements, we have no need to kill animals for our own survival, by virtue of that fact, I, I think we need to take a hard look at our excuses for killing over 10 billion animals. In this country alone, every year we kill 10 billion animals. I, it's just so amazing. It's so difficult to wrap my brain around that number. And it, uh, it's for pleasure. Personally, I believe that the real reason we kill and eat animals is simply because we can. And that's not good enough for me. Just because we can doesn't mean we should.
And in part two, we'll take a look at those incisors in our mouths that people keep pointing to to prove that we were meant to eat animals. And I, and I hope um, you'll join us for that. We'll see how they compare to the teeth of, of true flesh-eating carnivores. So I hope you join us, and thanks for listening. 